we customarily do with our uh, with prayer request. Who has a prayer request? I pray that Sissy and Ashley's baby will be born healthy and vibrant. Amen. And I know they'll be raised in a house that glorifies the Lord. Ten days apart.
pray that uh, Tom and Ashley's witness, the Graves family witness, will will speak to. Uh, I think Tom's mom's supposed to come out in a couple weeks, maybe. And if there's an opportunity to witness, maybe it will take place. Then. What else? We'll always remember my Bob. Always remember Bob and Riley and for salvation. The Graves. Yes, and uh, Renee's dad. Others? Yes, Mike. Praise the Lord for the baptism of today. It was great. Amen. Valerie?
Last week we actually finished the fifth seal, and tonight we will begin the sixth seal. We're going to be in Revelation 6. Uh, when you study the Word of God, one of the central prophetic themes in Scripture is the coming of the final day of God's wrath, okay? which is commonly referred to in Scripture as the day of the Lord. So when you see, from now on, when you see the day of the Lord, I want you to think of it as we're going to discuss it tonight. And it is true, we know from Psalm 711, Psalm 711 tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day. God is always upset with the wicked. Because God has to be upset with wickedness. But the day of the Lord is an expression that is used in the scriptures to describe special periods when God specifically intervenes in human history. God's hand, uh, think of the plagues in, on, on, on Egypt, that was a specific occurrence where God was utterly obvious and in control. That's one of my favorite phrases. Utterly obvious and in control. That's how God's supposed to be functioning in your life. That's another sermon. Utterly obvious and in control of the situation. And God will do that periodically. And the, the phrase, the day of the Lord, appears in the Old Testament 19 times. Okay? It's in the New Testament four times. And as I said, it's a unique time when God's power and holiness are unveiled bringing terror and death to his enemies. He functions through, uh, oftentimes, natural disasters and, well, brings down judgment upon his enemies. The prophet Isaiah described the day of the Lord as destruction from the Almighty. He also called it fury and burning anger. Okay. Ezekiel called it a time of doom. Joel says it's great and awesome. And Amos said it was a time of darkness with no light. The day of the Lord. Now this phrase, uh, which we're going to be looking at in, in reference to Revelation, is just not a reference to future and final wrath. It sometimes referred to imminent, what we'll call, for lack of a better name, historical judgments, okay, that we see, especially in the Old Testament, which, uh, uh, and these historical days of the Lord judgments were usually preceded by preliminary judgments, okay, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples. The preliminary judgments were almost always of lesser severity, and they acted as a warning. Okay, it's kind of like if you live in a if you live in a locale that is besieged by natural disasters. Now, some people would say would take that to mean that you live in a bad location. Other people might take that to mean that maybe you, as a people, as a nation are struggling with your spiritual condition, okay? Have you noticed an increase of natural disasters in America today? Amen. Wonder why. But the thing about these warnings, if they're not uh, heeded, there comes after the preliminary warnings a devastating judgment. I'll give you an example. Joel 2, 28 through 32, is a reference to the final eschatological day of the Lord, as described as we're going to look at in chapter 6 of, uh, of Revelation. But the sequence that lead up to that day is very informative. If you look at those first two chapters of Joel, they can be very enriching in regards to the way God functions in regards to judgment. In Joel 1, there's described an actual locust plague that came upon Judah, okay? And that's a preview of a near, what I call, historical day of the Lord. And that, that locust plague was a future, that was a, an indication to the nation Israel that it was time to get their act together. Did they get their act together? No. No. And what happened? The Babylonians came in and invaded them. But it's not that the people did not were not warned to turn their face towards the Lord. 
Testament. In Ezekiel 13, 5, the prophet declares that the day of the Lord is coming on Judah. Clearly, again, because these guys are contemporaries, okay? We sometimes think of these prophets like they were all chronological. One died and another one was born. Now, a lot of these guys were contemporaries. They walked around. They knew each other. Some of them were friends. Some weren't. But they walked around at the same time. And what we have here is we have Ezekiel giving a, another clear warning about the Babylonian captivity and what would become the total destruction of Jerusalem, the disruption of the entire nation's life in the Promised Land. Okay, that's a big deal. Okay, and the beginning of a 70-year captivity in a pagan nation. Uh, that day had not yet come when Ezekiel gave his warning, but there had been preliminary judgments that had already taken place. In 1597, 10,000 Jews were deported to Babylon. Why? To rid the country of its best people. Uh, uh, prior to 597, Daniel, who was like a, a, a princely figure in, 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 in his society, there had been another ex, a mass deportation of 10,000 people. That's how the Babylonians defeated you. They took away your best. The Assyrians killed your best. The Babylonians took your best. And that's what they did. And both of those deportations, I picture in my own mind as being preliminary judgments. It was 610 when Daniel was deported. You know, Daniel and his friends of, 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 of approximately 10,000 people. So those two, two deportations are what I call preliminary judgments. And they were a view of what was coming. It was as if God was saying... This is, and the, the prophets were declaring these things, were they not? Yes. They were, the prophets were declaring, get your act together, seek the Lord, and they didn't. And what happened in 586 B.C.? They wiped them out. They wiped them out, they burned the temple to the ground, and they com completely destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And in essence... For over 70 years, they, just, they ended the historical significance of Israel in the land that had been promised to it. Do you think that was hard for God to do? All these years, all this nurturing. But remember, it's like I tried to explain to you Wednesday night. God is willing to wrestle with you today get your attention. If you don't want, if you don't want to wrestle with God and you don't, because he's a good wrestler. <laughs> when you're wrestling and it, if somebody smacks you, you have a cloth, you can get them back or run. You have a choice. But if somebody's wrestling with you, they're hanging on to you. You've got to wrestle back. And if God has to wrestle with you to get your attention, he will wrestle with you. And you don't want to be placed in that position. But that's the position that God's people have placed them in. And then, so you have these preliminary judgments and then an actual day of the Lord type judgment. Of course, other times in the Word, we will find the phrase, the day of the Lord, referring directly to the final, God's final judgment at the end of human history. And this final day of the Lord also will have its preliminary judgments involved. And we have seen them, in essence, in the first five seals. The first five seals were the, are the warning. The sixth seal, God begins to act on the, of his own, of his own volition. He doesn't function through man anymore. He calls down his own might and his own fury. And that, uh, that, that day of the Lord is going to unfold in two stages. First, there will be during the tribulation, as I like to think the sixth seal is kind of a, an introduction to the day of 
want you to draw closer to Him each and every day. So to 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 worry about things that cause your sanctification to stagnate has never been profitable, never has been, never will be. Okay, we're in charge of grace growing at New Life Family Worship Center, as, as engineered by our Lord and Savior. So God has not chosen to disclose to us the time of the final day of the Lord or the return of Jesus Christ. But that hasn't stopped people from trying this at that time. And since the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and, and without warning, if the scripture tells us, as a thief in the night, believers that are alive during the tribulation, and there will be believers, are to live in anticipation and expectation of the imminent arrival of Jesus Christ to assume his throne. Speaking of his return, which will climax the first phase of what, I, of what we refer to as the day of the Lord, in Matthew 24, 42, Jesus said, Watch, therefore, for you do, know what, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Later, in 25, 13, Jesus says, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. See, every generation has a responsibility to be ready for the day of the Lord. And it's incumbent upon us as God's people to understand and prepare our children and our friends and everyone that we can influence around us to be ready for the day of the Lord. Peter said in 2 Peter 3.14, Beloved, Looking forward to these things, referring to the day of the Lord, be diligent to be found in Him in peace, or by Him in peace, without spot and without blemish. blemish. So I'll ask some of the same questions I, I, I asked this morning. How is your spots? How many spots do you have today? Because Peter says that we are to prepare for the coming of our Lord and to make ourselves spotless. That's what I'm, I'm trying to emphasize in the idea of the process of sanctification. Even those alive during the tribulation will not know the precise time of the day of the Lord. Even though, you know, what's the conjecture on how many people that are sitting in church today that will miss the rapture? That's one of the reasons I believe it's important to teach end times theology. Because I believe there will be a lot of people in the church that won't go. And they're going to be left behind, quote unquote, famous book series that's not all scripturally accurate. They're going to be left behind. But the problem is, in even being left behind, they're going to be confused. The only thing that will help them see clearly is Jesus Christ and their acceptance of Him. See, there will be, during this time, false prophets. Micah 3, 5 refers to, the, to people thinking, even then, even during that time, people will, you know, how much of the world's population has been destroyed by now? Do you remember? A quarter, a quarter. When I did that lesson six yes. weeks ago, 1.7 billion people, if it had happened that day, would be gone off the face of the earth. And Micah says that the people will think peace and safety is at hand. Peace and safety? It's only 1.7 billion in less than three and a half years. Peace and safety? Uh, there will be, there will be, a, there will be false prophets that will be giving false messages of assurance that every don't worry, it's all going to be okay. It will be. It'll be all right. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. It's going to be all right. And see, these lying deceivers is what they are. They're only lying. 
then they'll say, since the fathers fell asleep, in other words, since your, your, your prophets, your leaders fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You Christians, you're a bunch of crap, crack pies. You don't know what you're talking about. That's, that's what the word says that they will say. So, to get ready for the sixth seal then. Like the first five seals, remember I've talked about each seal being a force. Okay? And I like to think now of the sixth seal as introducing us to the arrival of the day of the Lord. Uh, it's called in 617, the great day of his wrath. And I think that the sixth seal is associated with a force also. And I believe the sixth seal is associated with the force of fear. Uh, fear is among the most powerful of all human emotions. Fear is capable of seizing control of someone's mind and bending someone's will. Fear can produce everything from cowardice to heroism. Fear can, uh, can cause people to be weak. It can cause people to be extraordinarily strong. Fear can cause passivity. It can cause aggression. It can cause confusion. It can cause someone to figure out and reason uh, adequately. It can cause clear thinking. It can cause total panic. Fear can strengthen your heart, and fear can make it beat faster. And sometimes fear has been known to make a heart stop. So these, the, the fears, and, the, and you know, we have a diverse, uh, we have diverse fears. Some people fear disease. Some people fear injury, death, loss of a loved one. Some people live uh, in fear of that. Some people fear losing their jobs, especially nowadays. People fear, there's people that fear, have you ever known anybody that was scared to speak in public? I remember, uh, you know, the Air Force would send us to school in, for, to increase our, uh, our ability to lead people. And so they would put you through these different segments of courses, and one of them was in public speaking. And there were some guys there. And they were, I mean, they were literally scared to death to have to stand in front of a group of guys that they actually ended up knowing very well, like 30 guys in the class for like six weeks. And they would just be scared to death to have to do that. People have, and you know, we call, we have all these phobias, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Being scared of snakes, a very righteous fear. Trust me. <laughs> Whenever I see them, I, I, I leave the area. Uh, people, claustrophobia, okay, phobias. Having fear of is actually the, the literal translation. So people fear all kinds of things. But you know the thing about people that I so enjoy is that uh, is that people often have no fear of the one thing they ought to fear. They ought to fear uh, what Luke 12, 5 says. Jesus said, this is Jesus' words, not Steve's words. I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. That's who people ought to fear. But see, we live in a present day society where we have a picture of God that uh, he's a, people consider him to be a benign grandfather <coughs> type of Or, a lot of people just don't care at all. They, they question his existence. But one day, uh, people will have, listen, one day people will have a consuming, a debilitating, an uncontrollable fear of the judgments of the living God. Jesus declared, declared that, described that time in Luke 21, 26. He said, men's hearts, failing them from fear in the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That word uh, failing in the uh, Greek is aposika, aposika, and it literally means to stop breathing. That's how fearful they will be. It means to expire. See, when the day of the Lord comes, 
sinners will be so terrified that some of them will faint, some will just drop dead. And we know from reading the scriptures that there will be some left that are so terrified they're going to cry for the mountains and rocks. Hide me. Don't let me be exposed to the fear of God. So I'm going to look, as we continue, at three features of this fear. First, I want to look at the reason for the fear. Then I want to look at the range of the fear. And then I want to look at the reaction to the fear. And that's our introduction. And our source scripture for not for tonight is Revelation 6. And we'll do just 12 to 14. If, the, if you're ready for the word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? amen. And would you please stand for the reading of God's awe-inspiring holy word. <laughs> Revelation 6, 12 through 14 follows. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Thank you. You can be seated. So, as I've said uh, before, Unlike the first five seals, the first five seals all had human representation. If you think about it, there were four horsemen, okay, for the first four seals. Then the fifth seal had the saints under the altar. But there is no human, no man type representation in regards to the sixth seal. This is God acting alone. And by the time this seal is opened, I believe we are beyond the midpoint of the tribulation. It's just passed. And the world is now begun into its last three and a half year period, which we refer to as the Great Tribulation. Okay? You have the tribulation, but the second half is the Great Tribulation, as it's uh, Matthew 24, 21 referred to it that way. By now, the Antichrist has desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. The abomination of desolation has taken place. The world has begun to worship him, and there has begun a massive persecution of any Jews and Christians that are still left. They are hunted down as if they are dogs. Incredibly, in the midst of this turmoil and chaos from the divine judgments that have happened to the world, it will still be business as usual on planet Earth. Even after 1.7 billion people have died, even after the abomination of desolation, even after the Antichrist has installed himself as the, as the God of all things, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37, he says, describing these days, he says, but as the days of Noah were, he says, these end days are like the days of Noah, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will be the coming of man. In other words, when Noah kept building that ark and people kept coming by and asking, what are you building there? And he said, it's a boat. And they said, what's a boat? And he said, well, it's a thing that floats along, along the water after it rains. And they said, what's rain? And then he had the, the perfect opportunity to proclaim the gospel, which he did because he was a righteous man. They all thought he was crazy. And they went about, even in their wickedness, they went about their same old daily routine. See, mankind, oftentimes, in times of turmoil, desires one thing, normalcy. We want our normal lives. Oh, 
got a new God on the throne in Jerusalem. And people are going to buy it. And people are going to attempt to live their lives. So as much as normalcy can be practiced during this time, it's not going to be easy. Realistically, it's a tough time. We think we were in tough times. We thought the Depression was tough times. These are going to be tough times. The warnings of the traumatic events of the five seals uh, that are the beginning of God's judgment go unheeded. It doesn't impact people to the point where they truly understand what's going on. But that will now change. Because the one that says he's God isn't going to be able to act like God. Because the one who is God is going to act like God. And he always does anyway. But those that the inability to understand who God is will no longer be available to be people because God will begin to exhibit His attributes as Creator, as Sustainer, as 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 Master over all things. God will begin to show the people of the earth who He is, and then people will think back to that Christian preacher teachers' warnings of divine judgment, and they will know that those warnings were accurate in nature. So as I have previously noted several times, the seals that we've examined parallel the sequence of events that are given to us by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, okay? We've talked about that several times. And the Lord describes the events of the sixth seal in the Olivet Discourse in 24-29, when he says, immediately after the tribulation, meaning the first three and a half years of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Luke adds to the same discourse, because Matthew didn't put it in his, and since the word of God is infallible, Luke adds in 2111, and there will be, Luke says, great earthquakes in various places, and famines, and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Later in 25, verses 25 and 26, Luke writes, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, and the sea, and the waves roaring, and men's heart falling from fear. We've already read about that. The expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the power of the heavens will be shaken. Old Testament prophets often wrote of frightening natural disasters in connection with the day of the Lord. Remember I referred to those in the Old Testament. Joel wrote in 2, 1 and 2, he said, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for, tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And then he goes on, it is a day of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, and people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor there will be ever since after them, even for many successive generations. And he goes on in verse 10, and he says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon glow dark, and the stars diminish in their brightness. Ezekiel wrote of violent weather accompanying the day of the Lord. Zephaniah, in regards to it, said that the day of the wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of, he called it desolation and devastation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So now John begins to record for us the <coughs> series of natural disasters which are the reason for people's fear. And first he says, there's a great earthquake. And that word in the Greek means it's great. It will be an earthquake. Uh, there have been lots of earthquakes recorded in human history, but it will be an earthquake. There will be lots of earthquakes in the first half of the tribulation. Okay? But this will be an earthquake like which there has never been before.
the event that John now sees is more powerful and devastating than anything that has gone on before. In fact, this one will shake more than just the earth. That's how powerful this earthquake will be. In the Greek, it's called seismos. It's the word that we ended up with uh, uh, seismograph, which is a seismograph. Seismos uh, is the word for shaking, and seismograph is a, is a shaking meter. It's a shaking, uh, something that measures shaking. And God, you know, God has often used earthquakes when he's about to make his presence known. Uh, what, at Mount Sinai with Moses, there was a significant earthquake. Uh, when Elijah called on God, there was a big earthquake. At the death of his son, there was a big earthquake. This is going to be a big earthquake. When he released Paul and Silas from jail, he used an earthquake as a part of the medium. Isaiah and Ezekiel are so both associate God's judgment with earthquakes. But this event causes the earth to shake, and it shakes the heavens as well. It will be of such magnitude, it will, I, I imagine it will be of such volume. Have you ever been uh, in an earthquake or a tremor? Or anything? They're pretty scary. And we lived in Athens for five years. You know, that part of the world uh, has a lot of earthquakes, and they have quite a few. It, does, it, doesn't, it never, never seemed to bother the Greeks, but it bothered everybody else. But a big earthquake is a very frightening thing. Remember, we examined the earthquakes when we examined the city of Philadelphia. Remember the city of Philadelphia, which was very close to a fault line. The people in Philadelphia had begun to live outside the city. They went to work in the city, but when they went to sleep at night, they slept in tents because they were scared of earthquakes. When there's an earthquake, you know who uh, you know who benefits? The psychologists and the, the psychotherapists and all those guys. Their appointments just skyrocket whenever there's an earthquake. People, because see, people don't like to be confronted about by something that they have no control over. And when you witness an earthquake, you understand the power, the phenomenon that is associated with that type of thing. So, uh, you know, there's people that move. They, they live. There were people in Southern California during some of the big earthquakes that just moved, that said, oh, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And, uh, but that is, people have an innate fear of things that are beyond their control and comprehension. And that is one thing that God will use to speak to people. The fears caused by earthquake will be greater than any fears that mankind has ever known. It will be scary. Not only will it be the most powerful earthquake in the history of the world, it will also be associated with unprecedented times. The people who experience this earthquake will have already survived worldwide war, devastating famines, and widespread epidemics of which we have never seen before that will have caused 1.7 billion people to die and here comes this earthquake. The like of which, if we're going to examine all these other phenomena that are associated with it, but the removal of the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, who was the restrainer, the divine one who has held back Satan and the Antichrist until God's appointed season, will now allow the world, the world will now be plunging headlong into an immorality that it has never known before. Wickedness will run rampant. The Antichrist will be worshipped as God, and his false prophet will go about proclaiming that utopia is at hand. What's the charter of the United Nations? Peace on earth. Utopia. That's the charter of the United Nations. And we're going to see a time where they will, even, even as these things begin to happen, they will still be proclaiming this time of utopia, but in an instant. When that earthquake comes, it will be utterly obvious who's in charge. And the lie of Satan 
will be exposed. Not, that won't change everybody's lives, but the lie of Satan will be exposed in the world's the world which had been banking, all these terrible things have happened, but we've got a new God who's going to take care of it for us. And then what happens? The real God steps in and says, guess what? You've been deceived. I am the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you're going to answer the way I desire you. So the first natural disaster that causes mankind to fear is a massive earthquake, such as the world has never seen before. And next week we will begin to look at the second disaster. The sun will become black as a sackcloth of hair. Do you know what a sackcloth of hair is? It's made from a goat, usually black goat hair. And you know who wears it? Warners. Used very purposefully in the scripture. Okay? Questions? Comments? Anybody? Got your tooth scared. Got your tooth Well, I hope we're all going to be gone. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. If you're not even clean, 1 Timothy, what is it? But God has not given us the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. But I believe, listen, I believe there'll be pastors left behind. What's that? I believe there'll be pastors left behind. I believe there'll be significant church leaders left behind. There'll be people that have been playing in Christianity and not people that have been living in Christianity. And that's what the Word tells us. You know, the way of the Lord is narrow. Many, many will come. The Word says... Many will come before Jesus Christ and he'll say, I don't know. I'm sorry. They'll come declaring that we did this in your name and we did that in your name. And he'll say, sorry, I don't know. Many. And the, and the, the, the way the work pictures uh, that whole thing is that there will be those that will, can't even, that will profess to know Christ and can't even find the gate. Never went, never mind, get on the narrow road. And the gate is, of course, a picture salvation. But there'll be those that can't they can't find the way to the gate. And then they'll go before the Lord and say we professed and we healed and we did this in your name. He's going to say Adios. 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 Yes. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, when you were talking about First Thessalonians, that scripture First Thessalonians, I always thought that was referring to more of the rapture than the second coming. Because the, the second coming Christians that are on earth, there's no about that. I mean, it comes right after the tribulation at our beginning. My Christians that have come to the Lord during the tribulation. Yeah, those that are left here during the tribulation. I've never, I've never even, I've never, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, Larry. I've never even thought of it the way you think of it. I've always thought of it the but way the, I thought. Of it. Scriptures in the First Thessalonians referred to the second coming rather than the rapture. You're talking about uh, four, you're talking about thirteen through eighteen. The first in First Thessalonians. When the Lord comes in the cloud, but His feet don't touch the ground. Right. right. That's when His feet don't touch the ground. He's calling His people. Right. That's, right. that's the rapture. Yeah. 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 You heard what scripture? Uh, well, I think it's. 4, 13 through yeah. 18, okay? 1 Thessalonians 5 or something. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. Oh, for the rapture? No, no. That's not the word. That's not what it's for. Let me, uh, let me look what at it. What are you talking about the rapture? Yeah, he's talking about rapture. Yeah. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Yeah, as if you go all the way back to 13, he's obviously dealing with the rapture. Yeah, I was quoting from 1 through 4. And, yeah, and so and, I'm tying in this whole context, this whole subject, as dealing with the rapture. And I believe First uh, Thessalonians 5 refers directly to the day of the Lord, because Paul changes his use of the Greek there, and he changes subject matter from from Thessalonians 4 to Thessalonians 5, he uses his uh, 
he uses a, a Greek words to, enter, in, to entertain the thought that he's changing his topic in First in First in, uh, first Thessalonians five one, and he's referring there, I believe, to the day of the Lord. Okay, the, the second verse in, in chapter five. Right. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Right. I always believe that his second coming, when he sets his foot on, on Mount Olives, that's going to occur at, at the Battle of Armageddon, at the end of the seven-year tribulation. So that's not really a surprise. That's true. Because but the phrase of thief in the night never, ever, as far as I'm concerned, is a reference uh, to, that refers to the rapture. It's always a reference that refers to the second coming. A thief in the night. In fact, if you read, it says happened? the day of the Lord begins, yeah. the second verse begins with the words, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. And the day of the Lord, it has to be a time of judgment. Well, I get, yeah, I get yeah. all that. It's just, it, the thief in the night is, to me, it brings up a surprise. It's something yeah. that's unexpected. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And that, and the rapture is unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Whereas the second coming is not so much of a surprise because we know that it comes at the end of the tribulation at our beginning. It, it will be a surprise to a whole bunch of people because they will be deceived. Yeah. Christians, you know, they will still have their Bibles. Yeah. Steve, haven't you been referring to something from Matthew that says Matthew 24. the thief of the night? Yeah. There's another there, one. Isn't it? And it was talking about the second coming there then uh -huh. as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Tom, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I thought he wanted to know about the rapture. Yeah. yeah. That's I think it's kind of interesting. Four verse 30 to 18. Yeah. I think we're in agreement. We just. Something yeah. else in yeah. great minds yeah. thinking yeah. alike. Revelation yeah. chapter 3, verse 10. That's a promise that you're not going to have to go through.